Howdy do, 2020 Flight Simmers, and welcome back to our fifth and final episode of our VFR flight tutorial course. So in today's episode, we are going to pick over the VFR chart and go over as much information as we can in the shortest amount of time that we can do it in. And we're also going to talk about Charlie and Bravo airspaces, along with some of the other airspace categories. And then finally, we're going to go over how to communicate with ATC entering those Charlie and Bravo airspaces. So if you want to know more about a VFR flight chart, then stay tuned right here on 2020 Flight Simmers. Okay, everyone, so welcome back to our most favorite VFR website here, and that is going to be skyvector.com. If you need to look down in the description, the link to the website will be down there below. And by the way, if this is your first time joining the channel, please go down there and hit that subscribe and tick that little bell, because you don't want to miss any future videos just like this one. And if you really want to support the channel, smash on that thumbs up button. It is much appreciated. All right, so let's dive in here on the VFR chart and let's see if we can't get into a little bit of trouble. So we're going to dissect this and we're going to go step by step. First thing we're going to take a look at are these big old numbers here in blue. You see 09, 12, 12, 14. All right, so what that is telling us is that that is the highest elevation in that area so mountains or whatever that kind of tells you that hey this is 900 feet 1400 feet 1200 feet etc so that lets you know you want to be if you're flying VFR at least 500 feet above ground level so if ground level is 900 feet 1400 feet is going to be your bare minimum in this location Nextly, we're going to take a look right over here to the right hand side and we're going to look at all these little campsites that well they look like little campsites and what that is is that is an obstruction of some sort. Now some of them are going to say what the obstruction actually is like right down here it has an arrow pointing to it and it tells you these are cooling towers. Now, one of the next things you're going to notice above some of these little TPs, you have lightning bolts and some of them don't have lightning bolts. Now, what is that all about? Well, the ones with lightning bolts, that means that there is a light at the top of whatever it is there, whether it be a building or a tower or whatever. That means that it's lighted so you don't run into it. Next, if you look next to any one of these TPs, you're going to see two sets of numbers usually. So these numbers tell you exactly how high this obstruction is. So if you were to hit this obstruction right here, these water towers, at its very highest point, your altitude indicator is going to read 775 feet. When you fall to the ground, you're going to fall down 695 feet. So that tells you the 695 is your AGL level. The 775 is your MSL level. All right, so I hope that kind of explains those a little bit for you. Next, we're going to come down here and take a look at these little flags. Now, all of these little flags that you see are VFR points that ATC can use to help you find your way to the airport. Say, for instance, uh, let's look over here. And you'll see this little flag right here, and it says Lake Diston. So that is a great VFR point. And again, ATC uses these points to help navigate you. Now, if you're unsure where this point is or what exactly they're talking about, don't hesitate to ask ATC, hey, I am not familiar with this area. Can you give me vectors to that? Or tell me what I'm looking for. They'll be happy to do so because ATC works for you. Next, we're going to take a look at all these little circles with R's in the middle of them. And you're like, what are these things? Well, that pretty much means restricted. Don't go there. Uh-uh. No, no. So most of these little restricted places are airfields. And some of them are listed here. It says private Hudson Airfield. 
And you don't really want to land at these places unless you've got a good reason to, or maybe your plane's just falling out of the air. Crash and burn, huh, Mav? So next we are going to take a look at the actual airport colors that you see. Because some of these kind of look the same, but some are in blue and some are in magenta. So we're going to explain what that means right now. All of your towered airports are going to be in blue. Every single one is going to be in blue. That doesn't mean the lines going around that airport are going to be in blue. That means the actual airport symbology is going to be in blue. All of your untowered, non-towered airports are going to be in magenta. So next we're going to take a look at the airport indicators again. Just looking at this airport right here, you're going to notice that this airport does not have a little magenta or blue circle around it like a lot of these other airports do. The airport lengths are pretty much to scale as much as they can be in the centers of these little airport indicators here. If you see one runway is longer than the other runway, that means that one runway is longer than the other one. So they try to make it to scale so you can easily more navigate the VFR chart. So in knowing that, when you see one of these airports that is bigger than this actual circle here can hold in, so this airport would way overextend this, so they don't even put a circle around this airport. So I believe it's any runway longer than 8,000 feet or 8,500 feet. All right, so the next thing that I want to take a look at here is when we're looking at any of these airports, this is a class Delta airspace, and you're going to notice that there are some areas in yellow around this airport. All the spaces in yellow tell us that this is a city populated area. So you want to be careful flying too low over in these areas because they're highly populated but it can also give you a great VFR reference point as to where you are located in the vicinity. Next, we're gonna take a look at this Class Delta Airport. And one thing you're gonna notice here is that the airport is in blue. There are two runways. You have a long runway here and a shorter runway up here. Now, the other thing that you're gonna notice is right between these two runways, you're gonna see a little circle here. That tells us that the VOR for this airport is right there, right next to the runway. So if you need to use the VOR to kind of navigate your way into that runway, that you can do that quite easily in this situation. Now what I want to do is take a look at what the VOR symbology looks like if it's not next to the runway. So for instance, in this situation, the VOR is right out here in the middle and the symbology for the VOR is going to be a little bit different than if it's right next to the runway. The next thing you're going to notice on here is the little star that's right over top of the airport indicator here. Now you're going to say, what is that little star for? Well, if you notice that on all the airports that have these stars, the stars are not necessarily in the exact same locations. It just so happens to be on these three, the stars are all in the northerly direction. So what are these stars and what are they for? Well, that star tells you that there is a lighted beacon at this airport and it's actually showing me the location of where that beacon is. So this way it can kind of help you while you're flying into this airport. Now, also taking a look at this airport indicator, you're gonna see these three little boxes coming off of this circle. Now, what are these three little boxes? What do they mean? And what do they mean to you when you're flying, especially in real life? Because that means this airport has fuel. So if you're running low on fuel, find an airport with those little boxes sticking out the sides of it. And most likely they have fuel for you to purchase. Next, what I want to do is look at the airport information that is usually right next to the airport indicator. Now the airport information is usually going to be in either blue or magenta. Whichever color the airport is in is going to be the color of the writing for the airport information. Now the airport information firstly is going to tell you which airport it is and also the ICAO of the airport. Next, it's going to give you a frequency for this airport and that is 119.25. 
the next thing you're going to see here is a little star. Now that means this airport is a towered airport, but only sometimes. So you have to check the airport information to find out the times that it is going to be manned in the tower. When it is not towered, the C here says that this is going to be our communication frequency for that airport when there is nobody in the tower. The ATIS frequency is pretty self-explanatory right underneath for the airport information. Now we have some numbers and letters down here at the bottom. Now the first set of numbers here, this 9-0, this tells us it is 90 feet above sea level. Right here, where you're going to see this little L and the star again, that means it is a lighted airport, but only at some time. So you're also going to have to check the NOTAM or the airport information to find out how to activate those lights when it is not a manned airport. So that'll tell you that information. Next on this information is going to tell us how long the longest runway on the airport is. Now we know it's not 74 feet. What you want to do is add two zeros to that and that tells us that the longest runway at this airport is 7,400 feet. We also know it's a Delta airport because of the dash blue line around it and also the maximum altitude is depicted right here in this broken box, which would be 1,500 feet. Again, add two zeros to pretty much anything and you'll get the correct number. <laughs> now, out of this airport here, because this is a VOR right here on the airfield, you're going to notice all these blue lines coming out of that VOR. Now, what those blue lines are, are airways that the planes are going to fly mostly for IFR. Now the next thing that you're going to notice because the VOR is right next to the runway you're going to see the compass rows right around the VOR and these compass roses are always put around the VOR so that you can figure out your radial inbound and outbound to the VOR. Now if you look over here to the left hand side Again, this information is also in blue, just like the compass rows around the VOR. So in this box right here for the VOR, or the frequency, is going to be 113.7. And then it's also going to give you your Morse code for that frequency because you're, you need to verify that Morse code. Now we've gone over that in previous episodes on how to verify your Morse code. And I believe we did a VOR to VOR course, and I'll go ahead and put a link down below on that, and that shows you how to read that Morse code there. So let's come down here and take a look at this Charlie airspace here. Now, one thing you're going to notice that this Charlie airspace is kind of right over top of this Delta airspace right here. Now, keep in mind that airspaces are not just two-dimensional, but also three-dimensionally. Now, one of the things you're going to notice about the Class Charlie airspace is that the airport itself is surrounded by two rings, and they're in magenta. Now, how you can tell the difference between a Charlie and a Bravo airspace is because the Bravo airspaces are going to be surrounded with blue rings. This airport here is highlighted in blue. So that tells us, one, that it is a towered airport, but don't let that confuse you with the color of the rings around the airport. Keep that in mind when you're taking a look at these VFR charts. You're also going to notice that this airport here does not have a VOR at the airport itself. The VOR for this airport is actually on the Delta, which is right here. And you can see that little circle right there on the Delta and you can see the compass rows all the way around it. And you'll also notice all of your airways going into the VOR right there. Now we're going to take a look at minimums and maximums for the airspaces here. Now if you start from working your way out and going in, the outer ring of this Charlie that is right here extends from 1,200 feet to 4,000 feet. Remember that trick I told you with adding two zeros onto the end, and that'll kind of help you out here. The inner part of this circle is from surface to 4,000 feet. So it kind of looks like an upside-down wedding cake. 
Now the next thing you're going to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm looking at these deltas here that are right underneath of this shelf, and it's got a minus one, two. Well, remember that this shelf extends from 1,200 feet to 4,000 feet. So what this negative or minus one, two means in each of these deltas is that the delta airspace extends from surface to, but not including, 1,200 feet. So that means at 1,199 feet, you're in the delta, but at 1,200 feet, you are now in the Charlie airspace. So I kind of hope that helps you out with these uh, maximum altitudes here in the delta when they're sitting underneath of a Charlie airspace. Now let's say you take off from this airport here and uh, you're only about 1,000 feet off the ground you come out of your Delta airspace, well, you are not in that Charlie airspace because you're only at 1,000 feet. You won't hit that Charlie airspace until you're at 1,200 feet. If you have any questions about that, please go ahead and post a comment down below, and I'll go ahead and try to answer that to the best of my knowledge that I can. Well, let's take a look at the airport information here for Daytona Beach International. Now, one, we can take a look at the airport depiction here and tell you right away that it's three runways. So we know we have three runways. We know the beacon for the airport is located right here. We know we have a highly populated area to the east and to the northeast. We also know that there is a speedway located right next to the airport. Next, if we take a look at the airport information over here to the right, we see that it's Daytona Beach International gives us the ICAO for that airport. It will also give us the communications frequency. And then it will give us the ATIS frequency. Next on the chart here, it's gonna tell us how high the airport is above sea level. So we're 34 feet. It is a lighted airport, and because it is an L and there is no star next to that L, tells us that it is lit all the time. Next to that is going to tell us the length of the longest runway at this airport, and if you add two zeros to that five, you get 10,500 feet. I believe this is your CTAF frequency, 12295, um, or just your general communications frequency. All right, so now we're going to come down here and talk about our Bravo airspaces. Now, most of the time, if you're in a GA aircraft, you're probably never going to enter a Bravo airspace. But let's take a look here at this Bravo airspace. And right to the north of this Bravo airspace, we have a Delta airspace right here. Again, if we take a look at the shelf restriction, this Delta airspace goes up and not including 1,600 feet, which is the shelf for this Bravo from 1,600 feet to 10,000 feet. So if we take a look at this airport diagram here, it, we can plainly see that we have one, two, three, four runways on this airport. The longest runway is 12,000 feet. And again, this is a lit runway all the time. Also, this airport here at Orlando does not have a VOR at the airport, just like the other Charlie. The VOR is actually located at the Delta, which you can tell right here because it has the little dot right next to the runway. And that tells us that the VOR is there and also the dead giveaway is the compass rose going around the airport. Again, that compass rose is going to be in blue, just like the airport is. And remember, this airport has fuel if you need it. Now, if we take a look at the Orlando airport, you're going to notice that the beacon location is in a different spot than you've seen in the past. Most of these beacon locations are placed in the northerly location, but over here at Orlando, it's placed all the way on the west side of the airport. Now let's take a look at this right here because we really haven't talked about this yet. And you're gonna see in this Charlie airspace, what in the world does a T stand for now? What is T over one three? So if we remember what we learned just a little bit ago about Charlie airspaces, is that this outer shelf is going to extend from 1300 feet up to the top 
of the Bravo. So I know that can get confusing, but the top of the Bravo in this section is 3,000 feet. Now we're going to talk about why this extends from 700 feet to the surface or to the top of the ledge of this Bravo here. Now what you're going to notice around this airport is a shaded magenta area. Now this shaded magenta area means that this is a class G airspace, but because it is highlighted in magenta, it tells us that the airspace only goes up to 700 feet. Now I know this is a lot to learn at one point, but uh, just, just bear with me here. So this particular section itself goes up to from ground level to 700 feet is class G airspace. From 700 feet to the top of the Bravo is going to be Charlie airspace. So all the way around this area here from 700 feet to the top of the ledge is going to be Charlie airspace. But below 700 feet in this area is going to be class G airspace. All right, so we're going to take a look at this airport right here again. It just so happens that this airport has a temporary flight restriction. And you know that because it has this red circle around that area. That tells us there's a temporary flight restriction. And if you actually look there in the box, it'll tell you uh, when it's effective for. Now, if we take a look at this Bravo shelf, again, we start out here at 10,000 feet down to 6,000. We step one point in and we go from 10,000 to 3,000. And if we step in again, we are at 10,000 to 1,600, 10,000 to 900, and then surface to 10,000 feet. We also have another class Delta airspace within this Bravo. And you can see within the broken box here that the maximum altitude for this Delta is up to, but not including 1,600 feet. So 1,599 feet, one more foot over, you are now in the Bravo. So you definitely don't want to break that airspace. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about how to communicate with air traffic control when you're either entering or departing a class Bravo or a class Charlie airspace. Now when departing from a class Charlie airport, the very first step will be to either contact clearance delivery or ground control to obtain your initial departure instructions. Now remember, for a Bravo airspace or Charlie airspace, you always have to be cleared through that airspace to go through it. I'm pilot. So that means you're always going to be contacting clearance delivery to get that clearance before you take off, before you even contact ground to get a taxi or departure. But when you look up the airport information, we've went over this in previous episodes, it's going to tell you on the airport diagram. So if we go right here to airport diagram. So if you pull up your airport diagram, right at the very top of your airport diagram will list your clearance delivery frequency that you're going to need. So in this situation, it's going to be 134.7 is going to be clearance delivery for Orlando International here. Now, when you contact clearance delivery to get a departure clearance for a VFR flight, you need to make sure that you include what type of aircraft you are, your altitude you're going to be cruising at, your destination, the ATIS code when requesting your VFR departure. If you don't have a specific destination, you can just let the air traffic control know or the uh, clearance delivery know the general direction of the departure that you want to go. Additionally, if you do require flight following when you contact clearance delivery to get that clearance, uh, you would just let them know that you would also want flight following once you exit the Class Charlie airspace. Then what will happen is the clearance delivery will provide you with initial departure instructions, the departure frequency, and a transponder squawk code to enter in your transponder. When you are ready for taxi, then you can call ground, provide your location at the airport. Ground will then provide you taxi instructions. Now keep in mind that when you contact ground for this, that you want to keep it pretty short because you've already given a lot of information to the approach or clearance controller 
and they're just going to pass that information over to ground so they don't need a long-winded request from you. So now let's talk about uh, arriving at a Class Charlie or a Class Bravo airport. So the process for entering the airport is pretty much the reverse of their departing procedures. So if you're not receiving flight following inbound to the airport around 20 nautical miles from that airport prior to entering that Charlie airspace, again, you do not enter any Charlie airspace or Bravo airspace without clearance to do so. You have to hear on the radio cleared through the Bravo or Charlie airspace. If you hear anything other than cleared through the Bravo or Charlie airspace, then you are not cleared through the Charlie or Bravo airspace. I don't want to hear commentary, argument, or opinion. And you're going to find the approach control frequency on your VFR map. So that is this frequency right here, 119 119.4, and that is going to be our approach controller whom we're going to contact when we're about 20 miles out. Now on initial contact of the approach controller, mind you, if you're not getting flight following, you should provide their call sign, the location, your altitude, what you want to do, your request, and the ATIS code from the airport. So it should be who you are, where you are, what you want to do, and what weather information that you have. Approach controller will then provide you a transponder squawk code that you can enter in your transponder. If you are already in communication with approach as a result of receiving flight following, then there's really no need to make any additional calls in either case. Approach controller will advise you to contact tower at the appropriate time, but remember, you still need to get permission to enter that Class C airspace. Even if you're getting flight following, that doesn't mean that you can just fly right into a Bravo or Charlie airspace because they're, you've, they've got you under flight following. You need to at least tell them what you want to do. If you have any other questions about the VFR chart or how to read it or what a certain part of it is, go ahead and post a link down below in the comments section and I would love to answer that question for you. Remember, if you haven't done so already, go down there and hit that subscribe and tick that little bell because you don't want to miss any future videos like this one. And again, if you really want to help us out, smash on that thumbs up button. It's greatly appreciated. Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us here on 2020 Flight Simmers. And as always, keep the blue side up. We will see you on the next one. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a great day.